Welcome to the Working CEO Podcast, where we share real advice for busy business leaders. No business school BS, no sugarcoating, just straight talk about how to get work done. 82% of CEOs believe lack of talent is the biggest threat to their organization, according to a recent LinkedIn Learning Workplace report. Blame the talent wars or the great resignation, but today's guests say there's a bigger underlying problem. The hiring process is broken. What's wrong and how do we fix it? Highwire's own Jake Christensen, Jake Parks, and Christian Hackenberg have some answers. That's up next on the Working CEO Podcast. Stay tuned. Glad to be back. I'm your co-host, Susanna Song, VP of Marketing and Communications at Highwire Networks. And I am here with the working CEO, Mark Porter, CEO of Highwire Networks. Hey, Susanna. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Uh, Living the dream. Thank you very much. So uh, I I wanted to jump right in with the guys today because we... uh, uh, have a little bit different format here today than our normal format of just a single guest. And while we normally talk about uh, um, CEOs and entrepreneurs with uh, lots of experience and how to help uh, others along the way on their journey, today we're here to talk a little bit about how to help people who are just getting started in their careers and how we think um, some things that we're doing might uh, really change the dynamic for, you know, entrepreneurs, CEOs, and just organizations in general, and how they, uh, how they go to market looking for the most talented individuals. So what I'd like to do is uh, introduce the, the guys today, because I think they have a lot of uh, commonality, as well as a lot of differences in their background and what they did. But the one thing about all of them is they're all collegiate athletes, and they're spearheading a program that, uh, that we're building around built around helping college athletes find that right first step in their career which pays very significant dividends to them over you know the decades that they're going to be employed so i'd like to go around and i'll have uh first we'll start with jake christensen and and then jake parks and finish up with christian hackenberg if you guys want to give a quick introduction to yourselves and your background yes sir good to be here today uh jake christensen i'm a channel account manager for highwire been here for about a year um, before that, I spent close to a decade in uh, medical sales, whether trauma, rare disease, kind of bounced around within that ecosystem. Um, as Mark alluded to, I played football in college, played quarterback at Iowa. And um, that's kind of what brought us together was that football connection. And among various other things, obviously, with helping athletes find jobs. Mr. Parks. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Jake Parks, based in Scottsdale, Arizona, originally from Portland, Oregon. Uh, Been with Highwire, similar to Jake, uh, just under a year. Prior to that, I spent a little bit over a decade at Adidas, working in various roles there, Um, some different sales roles, partnership development, partnership management, et cetera. Um, Yeah, and, and saw the mission that Highwire was on. Got to know Jake pretty well through some mutual friends as well as Christian. And we just thought, um, you know, there was a lot of runway here with this opportunity. And and I know we're excited to get it rolling. Christian? Yeah, Christian Hackenberg. Um, I think I am probably the most greenhorn of all these gentlemen and ladies on this call. Uh, This is what I like to joke around and say is my first big boy job outside of football. Uh, I played quarterback at Penn State. Uh, played in the NFL for a few years, and as they say, um, NFL stands for not for long. And uh, <laughs> with this program, um, we uh, we've really gotten to to dive into um, reflecting on experiences both on the field, off the field, and then holistically in terms of how we can make it better and this transition. So I think uh, this has been an awesome an awesome experience so far, and uh, I think we're only scratching the surface. You know, in a way, Christian, this is like your first internship in the real world, right? <laughs> so, exactly. That's exactly. awesome. He's, they're, they're, all three of these guys are doing a phenomenal job and uh, uh, all of them learning. I think it's an interesting study. And actually what we're going to talk about a little bit is that you've all learned a lot about uh, a variety of different businesses and working with a variety of different kind of companies just because of the diversity of our channel base and, and the, the types of customers that we work with. So. Um, I'm going to dive right in with something and, and I'll start with, we don't generally talk a whole lot about 
high wire networks on this uh, on this podcast. It's really more about entrepreneurs. So one of the things that a lot of people may not know is that we have a pretty substantial human capital management business, a staffing organization that does staffing, you know, from short term to long term to permanent placement and everywhere in between. So it's a pretty it's a pretty significant part of our business, um, and it's pretty scalable. And it's and it's something that's new to me personally. Uh, I've had involvement on and off with that part of the organization over the years, but now as the CEO and overseeing it, um, it, it brought to light some challenges that I see in how, how people do their hiring and the amount of help they need in doing their hiring and how this applies not just to the customers that we staff for in this business, which are the largest technology companies in the business, but across all of our channel partners um, in every channel that we touch, they seem to have this unique challenge of hiring. Um, it's competitive. The process is, you know, arguably broken. And we'll go into a little bit about that and why. And the, the, um, the challenge in adapting to new college graduates as you have these sort of generational gaps between the people doing the hiring and the people looking for their first employment. So um, why don't you guys uh, share a little bit about your passion and, and how it applies and kind of maybe we'll start with what do we see that's unique in uh, as we've as we've launched uh, a program that's specifically geared towards collegiate athletes who are not going to play professional sports what is the passion behind it why are we doing it and and who does it benefit jake you're on mute I'm sure it was. I'm well, sure it was a great there. start. <laughs> Such a great opener, too. What was I saying? Um, I think for us, it, it starts because it starts from a place of experience. We've all sat in that seat, and you know what you see on a recruiting trip and what actually happens on day to day are two completely different things. There are resources out there for you to further your career, but you have to really work for it and go after it and be very, very organized and be very mature at a young age when, you know, there, there's not a whole lot of um, advice around that's going to set you up for life after sports because everybody thinks they're going to make it to the league, especially when you talk about some of the, the, you know, like football and basketball, some of the men's sports, but we all stepped off campus with no plan, went home, on our parents' couch. I took the first job, you know, that was offered to me when I wanted to go live downtown with my friends and have fun and do that sort of stuff. And at the end of the day, I stayed there for a couple months and left and cost them who knows how much money to hire and, and, you know, replace me. And that sort of approach to hiring is really what keeps feeding the system and driving the cost of hiring up is there is really no true, gap program from college to the real world because the things that make you successful in the real world are not found in a book. So what, when you look at the college experience and I, I got a, a text this morning, that's why I was looking at my phone there. I wanted to pull it up. I got a text. Well, I guess it was late last night for my son who did his uh, orientation day yesterday as he, uh, got a real eye opener into what he, he now has his class schedule and his football schedule. And he just tallied up the hours and realized that he's got uh, 13, at least 13 hours a week in the classroom and at least 17 hours a week uh, in meetings and on the field. Uh, and that's without any studying, without any film, without any um, additional stuff that he, he knows he's going to be required to do. So that's, it's a pretty full week for, uh, for a, a young adult. What, when you look at the, the fact that uh, what a college athlete at, at any school, D1, D2, D3, when you look at what they're putting into number of hours and their, their overall lifestyle, what is it that you see that creates these challenges for them as they're you know, going through this process? Um, what, what, what kind of things do they miss out on? Since Christian, you were in college yesterday, yeah. maybe you should talk about it. <laughs> yeah, I could, I could it, was, it was two yeah. weeks ago, wasn't it? <laughs> I can't look back that far. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, it's funny you say that because I think there's there's a two pronged approach, right? Um, a lot of these kids who have to deal with that, 
in a way are actually sharpening a, a skill set that is very valuable for people who are hiring in terms of time management and something that we've talked about and is I would probably say one of our founding pillars of this entire program is that athletes have a very unique and elite soft skill set. And the, that's anyone who's hiring, and I'm sure Mark can say that, and I think all three of us are testaments that is a very valuable thing. Um, because without that foundation, there's really no productivity, no matter how much you know or learn about a certain product or certain technology or whatever it may be. Um, at the end of the day, if you can't communicate with people, if you can't be told no and figure out a creative way to try and get that into a yes or, or bring value, um, it, it doesn't matter how much you know about the product. So in a way, I think it's a, it's a positive, but where we see the gap and the gap that we need to fill is, is that oftentimes it's only geared towards football or the, the task at hand, whether it be lifting weights or whatever. So how can we create opportunities for, for them to sharpen these skill sets in a manner where they'll be applicable to the job force um, in a cram schedule where you probably realistically thinking back, I might've had three and a half, four weeks out of the year off when I was playing, I was either on campus for summer, very rarely got a week off or a long weekend during that. So the opportunity to really go out and start experiencing different jobs and requirements and seeing what the day-to-day -day is like in, in that, in that sphere, whatever channel it may be that I tried to attack where it was extremely limited. Um, and had I had the opportunity to do that, unfortunately I did get to play in the NFL and that was awesome and a great experience, but I watched a lot of my teammates transition and it's a, and Jake touched on it a little bit in his intro. It's a, it's a tough time when you sit there and you go through all this and you have a great experience, but then at the end of the day, it's time to time to be productive and time to put food on the table. Um, and you really don't have the opportunity to sharpen those skill sets and, and hone those skills and hone that focus in a certain area. Um, it's tough. So it's a two pronged approach. In one way, it's actually facilitating, I think, the candidates and the athletes. But in another way, um, due to the demand, it's also hindering them in their development from a higher ability standpoint. So we've talked about, um, you know, when you look at the time demand, so there are obviously some unique attributes, right? We talk about the hardworking. Uh, team team structure oriented, understanding leadership, which is I think it's really incredibly important, is knowing when to lead and when to follow. Right, uh, it's a uh, which is always a, a challenge in a team dynamic, and these apply to any team sports. Individual sports are, are also a tremendous value when it comes to you know just hardening your mind and and accomplishing a task at hand, and no excuses, and all those athletes have generally been told no or told they suck, and uh, didn't crumble, right? Or they wouldn't have gotten to where they're at. They, they figured out a way to get better and double down typically. So there's lots of positive attributes as you pointed out. Um, but they're often underserved when it comes to, you know, the, the true goal of most colleges, which is to get them employed, right? I mean, we're talking a fraction of one or 2% that get to go on. And in a lot of cases, when you look at uh, women's sports and life after college, there's not a lot of opportunity to even have a professional uh, career after that, right? And when we when we look at Division two and Division three athletics, it's an even smaller percentage of, of those kids that go on. So when we look at the the benefit the benefits of what we're trying to do, let's talk a little bit about what we are trying to accomplish uh, for the student athletes. Uh, specifically for the student athletes and then what are the benefits to them and, and how does this benefit some of our big partners who have signed on to participate as we go forward in getting this thing off the ground and, and trying to make a difference and want to tackle that well I have a couple of things yeah um, one of the problems with with the athletic schedule is is just that you have to pick courses that will allow you to make it to to practice. You can very rarely attend uh, job fairs. Uh, I don't know if I wasn't paying attention, but I don't ever remember the coaches or the academic center saying, hey, job fair, these companies are going to be here. I'm sure they did, but it wasn't in your face. It was like, you got to go find it somewhere on campus and it's 30 minutes before practice and, you know, you can't get excused from practice. So, and that's kind of that set up. And then on top of that, if you look at the curriculum today, it's really hard for colleges to keep up with the pace of change in business. Tech automation is rapidly changing business and, and automating tasks that before would take 10 people on staff in some sort of technical manner. So, you know, 
finding a way to we want to help them understand how their skills apply to the real world and how valuable they are and help employers evaluate them better at a better time as opposed to after you've hired them. Yeah, I would think it's, thoughts on that? Well, just to jump on what Jake's saying, I would think for an athlete, a student athlete, it's, it's a dilemma. There's a conflict because you're in it, you're hundred percent there for your sport, but there's also that chance that, a huge chance that you're not going to make it to the pros. And so I'm sure a lot of, and you guys can attest to it probably that, you know, you're, you're conflicted. Can I really have the best of both worlds? Well, typically in the past or right now, the way it works, if you're Christian, it's like I either make it or then I start from square one and figure out what I'm going to do. If you in the background are setting yourself up for life without sports and you have that to fall back on, you can't sit here and look me in the face and tell me that you're not going to play better. You just are. Yeah, that's like, it's a very interesting concept, Jake. It's something with me or we, we haven't discussed is – you know, when you take when you're taking a holistic approach to your life and you're preparing for all contingencies, which is by the way what every athlete does, every every top mental athlete does in their game, right? Is prepare for all of the options and and figure out the best way to compete on the playing field, right? Um, that definitely takes a load off if you're in a good place and you know that either way you have you know, you're setting yourself up for success. But Parks, you had a different journey, right? You were more buttoned up coming out of college. Yeah, well, buttoned up may be a term for less athletic also. So I, 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 uh, my, my decision was a little bit easier. Yeah, so, uh, you know, obviously, Jay Christensen and, and Christian Hackenberg went to big powerhouse Division One programs and could uh, – sling the pill uh, at an, in an elite way. Uh, I have a little bit of a, a different backstory. So I came from a really small town uh, outside of Portland, Oregon, and had an opportunity to go play at the University of Puget Sound, which is a division three institution, uh, significantly more well known for academics versus athletics. And from the moment I stepped on campus there, um, you know, football was always a priority and athletics on that campus are a priority but more so it is academically focused and they do want to set you up on a path to success and a path to employment. As soon as you graduate from that school, you know, I think the interesting challenge for me was even at that level from a schedule perspective, it was really, really tough to balance football, lifting, film work, along with a pretty rigorous academic schedule. And when we go back to, why we have a firm belief that companies should be considering hiring athletes even more so than they, they are. I look back on that and I look back on all the skills that I developed between the ages of 18, 19 and 21, 22, you know, there's just a really unique skill set that college athletics and college academics and balancing those two teaches you, whether it's time management, whether it's being able to be a self-starter, I think one of the biggest ones to me is communication as well. If you look at college graduates these days, you know, if they haven't been playing a sport, oftentimes they've been head down on a phone, head down in a laptop, in books, whatever it is, they haven't been forced to communicate with teammates from all types of different backgrounds, from affluent backgrounds, from poor backgrounds, from inner city, from rural areas. It's really tough to put a price and a value uh, on those communication skills and being able to work with folks from all types of different backgrounds, different stories, and people that are trying to go different directions in their life once they graduate as well. And I think that, you know, oftentimes when I'm, I'm looking at this program and figuring out what are we really trying to do here, I think it's bringing these graduate student athletes that have that diverse rounded skill set that you just won't find in the normal college graduate and bringing that into your company, it, it's invaluable to me. You know, you can yeah. teach graduates technical hard skills. You can teach somebody about cybersecurity or about IT infrastructure or about the staffing business, but you can't really teach them to be a great communicator or a, a self-motivated self-starter or somebody that has great time management and organization skills. And that's what college athletics and college academics and balancing those two teaches you. 
I think there's something really interesting in there, Jake, that um, as an employer, I can tell you that I've witnessed firsthand is, um, and, and you know, in addition to you guys, we have at least, at least one other former NFL player on staff who, who's a phenomenal guy. But what, what every one of you has in common is that the, the ability to network and the network that you built in college and, and with the alumni networks of your schools and those sorts of things, that is really, really valuable. It is really important. And it is something that most college, uh, I, I suppose, fraternities and some other, some other organizations and schools give you some measure of that, but they don't generally create the reach and the connection, the level of connection that we've seen in college athletics the opportunities to network when you're, uh, I was, I was just listening to somebody uh, tell me the other day um, uh, w- while golfing about golf outings, they attended um, uh, the gentleman who worked at UW Madison and he, golf outings that he attended where it was all of the wealthy donors, all of the really well connected alumni and each foursome had a football player in it. Each, uh, they, they had, or uh, yeah, I believe it was either a football player or one of the, one of the more prominent athletes on campus to raise funds for the school, right. For the athletic department and those things. And we talked about this, um, yesterday. In fact, we talked about the fact that, um, what did they do? Uh, they, they got a little squirrely, right. It was a golf outing. There was alcohol, there was drinking. It was a complete wasted opportunity for, in his case, the quarterback of the football team who never went to the NFL and had to go get a job. Uh, and, and, you know, the, I think Jake Christensen, you've mentioned exactly that experience over time because nobody prepared you for the fact that these were real networking opportunities. And that's where we want to want to get to. So, guys, we've got just a couple of minutes left. We'll, let's share what we see as sort of the solution to the athletes. Let's talk a little bit about the concept of the four year internship and and what we what we see that we can do to help these athletes leveraging our, our corporate sponsors, leveraging the, the corporate partners that we work with day in and day out, and how they benefit a little bit, but what's it, what's in, what's in it to, for these athletes in the four year internship and how does that help shape their careers? I think if we keep it really, really simple in our minds, it's about starting the process earlier for both sides and giving athletes a chance to see multiple things. And it doesn't have to be just athletes, but we're passionate about athletes, but letting them find their way earlier instead of quitting jobs and moving on and costing money for employers and costing just that, that change that didn't have to happen because they started when they got done with school. So starting so, it earlier, giving them a better view and giving employers a better view of them. To and how do we do that with, how, you know, how do we accomplish this with such compressed schedules, compressed summer, the NBO, I've got uh, college graduates working at the country club, uh, slinging drinks, right? Cause they didn't have the chance to get the right internships and they don't know what they want to do yet. How, how do we do this with their schedule limitations? If I, one thing I'll tell you is, is yes, the, the schedule was hectic, but once you get the hang of it, there's a lot of free time. There was a lot of video games we played. There was a lot of stuff we did that was a waste of time in the summertime. I mean, you basically work out and go to seven on seven and then. You You're know, still playing try, video try games to, during the day, aren't you? And try, <laughs> try not to get in trouble the rest of the day. Yeah, Guitar Hero. I mean, it was all of it. So there's a lot of wasted time. And on top of that, you have hours you're spending in the learning center, academic learning center, eight hours a week usually is what I was doing. And, I mean, the amount of time wasted there is is the exact same example. I mean, everyone's trying to get around the system because they don't want to talk about school. So how, how do we solve for that with – the, you know, the concept of the micro internships and, and those, let's talk a little bit about what you guys have come up with there. Yeah. I mean, I can, I can tackle some of that. And I think on a, on a grander scale too, Mark, to answer some of all these questions, it's, it's really about trimming the fat and streamlining it. You have two different, two different, completely different sectors when you talk about it from a business sector and then the college football business in its own and what the end goals are for each of these people. And you have to sh- find a way to mesh both of them. 
And they all have things in place. You have companies that do sponsor internships. You have some schools that do put more of a focus and an emphasis on connecting with their alumni and employers and things of that nature. But at the end of the day, like you said, a lot of these things don't mesh. So the early engagement's huge, starting it earlier and stretching that internship to four years and then making it mold and fit into um, these athletes' schedules. And like Jake said, there is a lot of time. And just getting them to realize the value in that and what that can bring. Um, it's really trimming the fat on both of the processes, I think, and streamlining it. And you need someone to be able to run that. And that's what we're here for. And it's a better way to evaluate for the candidate and the company as a first step in the hiring process. To put, put someone with your team and just see if they fit in in general. It doesn't take long to see. Think, think about, think about the process of buying a car. You don't just like buy a car, usually. You test drive it, you do your research, you see what it is. So why would you, as, a, as an employer, do anything different when you're hiring somebody? Well, I, I think about it even more in broader perspectives in terms of human interaction, Christian, where um, the opportunity, you, no matter no, what, no matter how good your hiring process is, no matter how thorough your interviewing process is, um, there's always some trepidation as an employer on are they going to be a great fit? Because it is really costly to have somebody come in, not be a good fit, not be happy, not like the culture, potentially disrupt your culture, especially in small and mid-sized companies. That's really important. And, you know, even in any organization, look at the way they're comprised. They're comprised of teams, right? That's just the way we organize businesses to keep it, you know, to keep the proper governance and all those things. Just one bad hire on a team of 10 has a substantial impact in the, in the culture. So there's always trepidation on the employer's part. There's always trepidation on the employee's part. Did I make the right decision? Am I gonna fit in all those things? So when you look at it in terms of human interaction, I liken it you know, more to the process of, you know, this is more like finding a mate, right? You wanna, we want to get these young athletes exposed to as many potential uh, employers along the way as possible so that when it comes down to it, they get that good fit because the difference in that first job, when you really look at the financial impact and then the long-term trajectory impact on having the right first job or for sure the right second job, right? Um, being able to get that good fit, get the, the, get, you know, even if it's a few thousand dollars a year more in pay scale, it really has an impact when you look at it over a, a 15, 20, 30 year trajectory on getting that right fit. Because if you start over every two years, that's going to be a real problem for you. And, and I know we've talked about this internally, but the college system in general is designed to turn out cogs in a large wheel. When you look across the lay of the land today, um, People are constantly reinventing themselves and constantly changing their skill sets. If you find the right organization that allows you to do that and allows you to be you and allows you to, to um, you know, leverage all those things that you learn, it's, it's a really, really critical first step. And as Jake pointed out in his, in his case, you know, how many of us make a misstep in, in, in that first job versus getting the right place and getting the right skill sets and learning, um, you know, finding room for promotion, finding rooms, opportunity to do different things in the same organization because job sharing and skill splitting and all those things are becoming real issues in the modern, in the modern workforce. So I think there's a real shift afoot just in what companies need, what employers need. And, um, you know, hopefully we can help solve this by, you know, doing the things you guys have mentioned here before. So um, this is really the first and hopefully a series of conversations around this. We, we think employment, I, you know, as an employer, um, you know, my commitment to these guys and the reason these guys are here is because as an employer, uh, second only to uh, keeping my family fed is keeping the, you know, keeping the families behind every employee, um, you know, fed and paid and all of that good stuff. Employing people is a real serious responsibility. We think that there's a better way to do it. And uh, we're looking forward to hopefully changing the landscape, uh, at least for a few. We can't change it for everybody, but hopefully we can change it for uh, you know the people that, that we can make a difference for. 
Yeah. And we've barely touched the surface on there's There's a lot to uncover and I'm excited to see where this program goes. Stay tuned. Uh, this was just a teaser. We'll have much more about this program, uh, which we've called the field pass, uh, truly understanding that the hiring process is broken. And so we will have much more out there in the coming days. Thank you to our guests, Jake Christensen, Jake Parks, and Christian Hackenberg. Thanks, and guys. Thanks, and thanks to you, our listeners, for joining us. If you have feedback or questions on today's podcast, you want to ask our three guests any questions, please contact us at podcast at highwirenetworks.com or leave a comment below and be sure to join us for our next episode of The Working CEO. Until next time, I'm Susanna Song. I'm Mark Porter. I just want to say don't email for any Jake Parks autograph requests at that address. Those are very limited. (laughs) You got to know somebody to get one of those. He controls the market on that. (laughs) He's got to loosen up the shoulder for that. (laughs) And And this is The Working CEO. Thank you for listening. Please subscribe so you don't miss the next episode of The Working CEO. Remember, whether your collar is blue or white, roll up your sleeves and let's get real. The Working CEO is made possible by Highwire Networks, a leading global provider of technical, professional, electrical, and managed cybersecurity services, serving businesses in more than 180 countries. To learn more, visit highwirenetworks.com.